what I really like to focus on is to giving you a little bit more background about this initiative called Movement of Life, but also to highlight the incorporation of emerging technologies and how our two organizations, Iridium and the Smithsonian, are working together to conserve habitats and the species that use them. Um, I have a long history of working in East Africa. Um, I've worked in Kenya since 2010. So this picture here is actually me as a graduate student studying wildebeest across the Amboseli ecosystem. I think the main point of the things that I want to highlight to you is that um, in almost everything that I do, we're trying to see how we can harness technology. How do we actually learn more about these animals? And that means as an ecologist that I'm often incorporating, for instance, GPS device that is Iridium enabled with Earth observation satellites so that we know how the landscape is changing and we can start to evaluate how animals are responding to those changes. This is actually what an addix looks like. Um, addicts are one of the most critically endangered antelope on the planet. This picture alone has 16 individuals and that's roughly 10% of the world's wild population. So this picture was taken at the Termit Tintuma Reserve in um, central Niger in North Africa. But what it highlights is the need for technology to evaluate where these animals are moving. Um, in all cases, this these data are being transmitted via the Iridium network. Um, given the remoteness of this location, we're also using PTT, handheld units to provide better security for our staff um, when they are working in areas that are remote, but also in many cases, sometimes very insecure. For those of you that joined the Iridium Partner Conference in Palm Springs, um, you'll know that I talked about three case study examples. The first of which was the reintroduction of scimitar horned oryx. The second is the analysis on the movements of all four species of giraffe across Africa. And the third was the essential aspects of the Iridium constellation to provide near real-time information to stop or reduce as much as possible the poaching threat to Asian elephants in Myanmar. For those of you that didn't join, what I want to drive home is that what we're really focused on is how animals are moving. And to do that, we are using a variety of devices. So in this animation, our colleagues have fit white storks with GPS tracking devices, and these animals have moved broadly across Africa. Here they overlap with wildebeest that I was tracking during my PhD before moving further south across the continent and overlapping in the Kruger National Park on the boundary between Mozambique and South Africa with buffalo and then also with elephants. Until doing the return journey across the continent, across the Sahara Desert, through the, the Sinai Peninsula and around the Black Sea, before returning back to where we actually caught them within, in many cases, two to five meters where they were nesting the year before. So the video really showcases the connectivity that exists across continents and this incredible phenomenon known as migration. The truth is that across many of the ecosystems where we inhabit, humans inhabit, we have put a variety of borders and boundaries that now are restricting animals. And scientists are calling this the sixth great extinction. So here we have a zebra with um, a fence that's directly in the path of its historic movement rates, um, movement pathways. So the question is, how can this animal actually access the resources with all the barriers that are being put in its way? What we find, and this is an example about migratory birds here in North America, is approximately we've lost about 3 billion migratory birds in North America alone since 1970, so over the past 50 years. That's roughly about a third less birds than there were just 50 years ago. 
the Smithsonian's role in this emerging field of movement ecology has been in research and discovery. So here there's an image of a former Smithsonian researcher holding a VHF antenna and tracking an animal that has been fitted by a very small device that is an, emitting a unique signal. This is certainly a, a huge advance because these devices can be very small, but there also are some cons as well. For instance, um, you only can hear this animal if you're within a specific radius of the animal, and then you have to actually collect your position on the landscape to understand where it potentially is. So it's a lot of effort to actually collect where these animals go. Starting in the early 20th century, one of the earliest forms of animal tracking was bird banding. And this gentleman here is a, a guy by the name of Paul Barscht, who was a researcher at the Museum of Natural History. And what he did is he put bands around these black crowned night herons with a simple inscription, return to the Smithsonian. And so Paul is credited as being the, the father of modern day bird banding. Again, here you do get some information, but you have to recapture the animal in order to determine where it was and where it is currently. In the 1970s, the first animal, terrestrial mammal, was actually tracked by satellite. Um, and this was a collaboration between NASA and the, well, obviously the Smithsonian, but also the Craighead brothers, which were famed wildlife ecologists. And what they did is they basically put a cartoonishly large collar that weighed 25 pounds. It cost $25,000 um, to manufacture, and it connected to a weather satellite, the Nimbus 2 satellite. So this was pre-GPS. The positional accuracy for this animal was roughly 10,000 soccer pitches. So we could tell that the animal was somewhere in Wyoming. So positional accuracy was poor, collar weight was awful, and the cost was also ridiculous. And so this attracted a lot of international attention, but not in a good way. The reason I show it is because science is made on incremental small steps. So um, just like Iridium, where you are today is very different than where you were in the 1990s. And so it does take vision and um, forethought on where you would like to be in the future. Because today, with tracking devices, we're now at a collar weight roughly, or a tag weight of less than five grams. So this small little device, 20 millimeters, can collect about 60 to 70 positions um, with a position of accuracy of roughly two to 10 meters. And so the animal pictured here is an Eastern meadowlark, which is one of the most endangered grassland species in North America. To give you just a little bit idea of some of the things that I work on on a daily basis. So I've worked in Kenya since 2010 with a specific focus on these white bearded wildebeest. So there are keystone species across grassland systems. And we really have two main questions that we're trying to answer. One of which is simply, how is the landscape changing? And in some cases, we can do that with Earth observation satellites. But then once we know how the landscape is changing, we want to understand how wildlife populations are responding to these changes. So one of the things we've been doing is being, we've been working with local teams in Kenya. So these rangers, for instance, that have in their hand a Garmin inReach device so that we can collect really fine scale information on how that landscape is changing and actually receive the data in near real time. So together with the Mar Elephant Project and the Kenya Wildlife Research and Training Institute, we now have a dynamic data set where these rangers can go out on a daily basis. They can collect information, for instance, about fencing across the region. They can collect the attributes of that fence, when it was erected, when it was potentially taken down, but also whether or not it's a three-line fence, a four-line fence, or potentially even a five-line fence that's about two meters tall and potentially if that fence is electrified. So all these things have a huge impact 
on the animals that we're trying to conserve. Importantly, with the technologies, with the Iridium constellation, we can actually receive that data in near real time. So we're not waiting months, years to analyze the data. We actually can do it right away. And so to give you an idea of the things that we're working on, this is a figure that was published in National Geographic in December 2021. At the center of your screen is the Masai Mara National Reserve, just on the boundary between Kenya and Tanzania. It's the northernmost point of the Serengeti ecosystem. All the little brown and beige points in the image are all wildebeest that have been fitted with a GPS tracking device. And so you can see that we have actually a very good idea of where these animals have gone over time. What I want to draw your attention to is this large arrow in the main part of the screen. This simply shows the historic movements of these wildebeest across the system. And so historically, we know that animals would move from the western part of the ecosystem, known as the Mara Plains, to the eastern part of the ecosystem, known as the Loida Plains. The other thing that's been happening is that there's been a dramatic amount of fencing that has occurred across the system. Those rangers that I mentioned have gone out every day. And so all these little pink polygons are all fence boundaries that physically they have mapped on the ground. And so wildebeest, what we know is, although they can jump a fence, they're notoriously bad jumpers. And so what we find is that unfortunately, many of these animals are getting cost, caught in the fences. And we're trying to actually catalog and characterize what the mortality rate is. At the same time, what we're trying to do is incorporate all these type of data all together. So talking about data is never super sexy, but for what we do, um, this is really the, the goal of what we need in order to really talk to people on the ground. So a lot of times we'll get the data on the wildebeest movements, we'll create a model which predicts where these animals are moving across the landscape. In this case, what I've highlighted here in green are three priority areas that just 10 years ago were being used heavily by wildebeest. What we then can do is overlap these pathways with the fence boundaries so that we can prioritize which fences potentially can be removed either uh, temporarily or permanently. And because we have a linear map of where these fences are, we also can calculate the cost to remove the fences. So what would a, a Kenyan landowner have to be paid to remove his fences and facilitate movement? The second piece that I wanted to talk about is how wildebeest and wildlife in general are responding to these landscape changes. And for me, this piece is really the cornerstone of modern conservation biology. This is what I spend actually a lot of time doing. In the Maasai Mara or other grassland systems globally, this is most regularly done either by vehicle where people are doing driving surveys and collecting what they see, or more formally, especially across big areas, by using a plane. And when a plane flies across this region, there's generally two rear seat observers, and that is just what it sounds like. There's two individuals that are looking out the plane window, and within a fixed um, transect width, in this case, 150 meters, counting every individual animal above the size of a Thompson gazelle. The challenges here are that we're using methods right now that are derived from the 1970s. And so that means any type of manual analysis when people are collecting data in the field, they're now transcribing it to a computer. So one of the questions is simply, you know, why are we not using more advanced techniques to do this electronically and syncing with, for instance, the Iridium constellation? What we know is this manual analysis is labor intensive. It can take oftentimes weeks, months, or sometimes even years to get results. You can imagine if you have a rear seat observer that's looking out its window 
for two, three, or maybe even four hours, that can get very tiring, which means that the results often can be error prone. And also these surveys can be extremely expensive to conduct. So how do we use technologies to make this more efficient, more economical, and more accurate? So what we did in March of last year was we flew a standard survey across the Mar Mara Reserve. So you can see the Mara Reserve in this image here. All these dashed lines are the flight transect of the plane. And so to maintain continuity, we did a rear seat observer count. But at the same time, we fitted a digital camera to the belly port of this airplane and collected a picture every two seconds along the flight transect. So across this four day survey, which covered the entire ecosystem, we collected somewhere between 600 and 700 gigabytes of data and roughly 11,000 images. So to give you an idea of the quality of data that we were able to collect, this is one of the images that was collected along these surveys. If I zoom in, you can clearly see when you're with your own eyes that this is an elephant. You can see the shadow of its tail. You can see its backbone, its ears, its tusks, even its trunk. And so the idea here is that if we can identify objects, elephants with our own eyes, what can we potentially program a computer and use machine learning, artificial intelligence to make it much more efficient to go through this full catalog of images and do this more accurately and more efficiently. Just to give you an idea of some of the other images we collected, in many cases, the habitat is, is or can be very heterogeneous. So here it's much more bushy habitat. But again, if we zoom into this area, what you'll see is zebra, and you can actually see in the northern part of the image, a wildebeest. The other piece that we're very interested in addressing is trying to count livestock across the ecosystem. So here you can see cows in your image. We also can see sheep and goats. And it, even in the image, it's hard to tell from a nadir perspective of the plane, but if you look at the shadow, you can definitely tell that these are donkeys. So what we're working on right now is basically a human in the loop annotation interface. So we're working with Microsoft AI for Good. We're working with computer scientists at UC Santa Barbara so that we can use this survey and see if it can be used, at least the methodology, the foundation, to be applied for other systems globally. And so AID, A-I-D-E, stands for Annotation Interfaced for Data-Driven Ecology. So the way it works is we have a human look at a subset of the images that were collected. So roughly 10% of the images have been annotated. In this case, what a human will do is go in, simply put a box about the around the objects of interest, in this case, elephants, to train the model then to then look at the rest of the images in the catalog. The model will then be fit. And in this case, the dashed lines represent the uncertainty, the model prediction. And in this case, the model predicted two elephants and a third object, but it identified it as something else. So in this case, again, a human would go in and correct the model so that it could be rerun and improved. So this is very much a work in progress, but the type of experiment that we ran is aimed to get at what the optimal survey altitude is. So again, how can we make this more efficient? Do we need to fly at just 400 feet or could we fly much higher and still reliably count specific species? So what species can we reliably count across this system? And most importantly, any models that we develop in the Masai Mara ecosystem, can we then apply them to other systems globally? To highlight just one other thing that we are pushing on, this really is the edge of what we're able to do. So this is a Maxar imagery, a 30 centimeter resolution imagery of this same ecosystem. All those little fleas in the image or what look like fleas are actually wildebeest. So um, 
there is some confusion between wildebeest and, for instance, zebra, but what we can tell is the difference between an animal and its background. So this is a paper that should come out in the next week or so. Finally, I'd like to really just walk through very briefly some of the projects that we're working on in collaboration with Iridium. And there are six projects that we aim to really push on over this next year. The first one is a bobcat study here in Albemarle County focused on understanding the habitat connectivity to decreased road mortality on bobcat in our backyards. And so, so far, we've been collaborating with Virginia Tech. So they have a graduate student that has been able to fit six animals with GPS iridium enabled devices. Unfortunately, one of these animals has all already been struck and killed by a motorist. So um, it's an unfortunate reality, but it's the question that we're trying to address. If we shift from North America, we have three projects that we're pushing on in Kenya. The first of which is a study on marabou stork. So this is a study where we'll be tagging up to 10 individuals this June to August, so very recent. And what we're interested in here is marabou stork um, spend a lot of time in human dump sites. So there's potential that they are part of the network that is transmitting disease across the ecosystem. So how do they move? How do they interact with livestock? How do livestock then interact with humans? The second study is uh, a brand new study on Maasai giraffe. So there's never been a movement study on Maasai giraffe in the greater Mara ecosystem. Um, we're trying to tag up to 25 individuals. Just like the wildebeest, we aim to assess connectivity and to evaluate how these animals respond to anthropogenic disturbance. So those fences that I mentioned before. Give you an idea of what it takes to tag a giraffe. This is a um, separate project on reticulated giraffe. So found in Kenya, but in the northern parts of Kenya. So in 2019, we tagged 28 animals together with the Giraffe Conservation Foundation and San Diego Zoo. Um, in many cases, we use a helicopter to help us spot where the major groupings of giraffe are located across the system. Once the team actually identifies where they are, it's a little bit like a coordinated rodeo. So we're working with the team on the ground. The veterinarian then darts the animal. And then what we try to do is get this animal, which can be anywhere from you know, 19, 20 to 21 feet tall, on the ground as quickly and safely as possible. Once it's on the ground, we give it a reversal drug. Drug. We take some basic biological measurements. In all cases, we're trying to do our best to process the animal very quickly and keep it cool. Then we also fit a device and the iridium enabled device, which has a solar panel, is shown here. In this case, it was fitted to the animal's acicone which is the horn-like protrusion on the top of its head. In the Masai Mara, we're going to be fitting the same device, but we're gonna be putting it on the animal's tail. So basically to be as non-abusive as possible. The third study in Kenya will once again be focused on wildebeest. So I mentioned that we're prioritizing fences for removal. This study is more on the validation side. So we want to reestablish movement, but by fitting these animals with collars, we actually can validate and determine, are they actually really using these areas that we have begun to restore? We'll shift our attention then to Brazil. And in Brazil, we plan to fit six to 10 jaguars, the dominant predator across Atlantic forest uh, ecosystems. Here again, you'll see a trend in assessing connectivity and also habitat usage um, with the goal of reducing human wildlife conflict. So reducing predator pressure on livestock. In some ways like giraffe, jaguar can also be very difficult to tag. So this is some camera trap footage of a male jaguar. 
that was being baited to a particular area. And so you'll see the bait ball at the top of your screen. That bait ball is aimed to lure the animal to a particular pathway that has a foothold trap, uh, a wire snare. Um, what you'll see is that this animal is pretty wary about what potentially is in store for him. And so he takes a step forward and then says, either something doesn't feel right or something doesn't smell right. And in this case, this male, we were un unable to trap, he moved from the area. Then the last study that we have proposed is a study in Laos, so just to the west of Vietnam, where we're aiming to focus on a species rehabilitation reintroduction project on Asian elephants. So these are elephants that have been used in logging in the past, and we're trying to get to the point where we rehabilitate these animals into the wild. And so again, Iridium enabled GPS tracking devices will be fitted on elephants so that we can track where they're going and how they are integrating with the wild populations. So that is a very, very brief synopsis of some of the projects, but in each case, it really showcases how we're using technology. Um, so I'm very proud of this collaboration between our two organizations and yet excited for Pathways Forward.